Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webcast entitled, Anal Cytology Screening, Why, Who, How? Presented by Dr. Joel Pileski, Professor of Medicine, Division of Infectious Diseases, University of California, San Francisco. And Dr. Teresa Dara, Professor of Clinical Pathology, Department of Pathology, University of California, San Francisco. Following the talk, we'll have a short question and answer session. You can ask questions at any time during the presentation via the web using your Ask a Question box. If you should need technical assistance, type your inquiry into the tech support box on the left side of your screen and click the Send button. If you are disconnected, you can log on again using the instructions provided to you for accessing this webcast. If you cannot log back on, please call 877-843-9272. That number again is 877-843-9272. It is now my pleasure to turn the webcast over to Dr. Joel Pileski. Thank you very much, Katie. Good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure to be uh, talking to you today about anal cancer screening, why, who, and how. And I'd like to begin by uh, indicating our disclosures. Uh, I received travel support, research grant support, and support for sitting on a scientific advisory board from Merck and Company, and I sit on scientific advisory boards for PharmaJet and Aura Biosciences. Dr. Dara, who will be following me, receives uh, support for research supplies from Hologic for anal cytology, and sits on the scientific advisory board for OncoHealth. So, <coughs> what we're going to focus on today is why we should be thinking about anal cytology screening who to screen, how to collect, how to process and evaluate the anal cytologies, and how this process may or may not differ from cervical cytology. We also want to talk about how anal cytology performs as a screening test for what we will henceforth be calling AIN, anal intraepithelial neoplasia, the anal equivalent of CIN. Uh, let's start by asking what people are doing right now. Polling question number one is, which of the following constitutes the largest number of patients screened for AIN in your setting? A, HIV positive men and or women. B, HIV negative men who have sex with men, we'll call them MSM from now on. C, women with cervical or vulvar HSIL or cancer. D, none or E, other. Okay, so it looks like roughly a third or so of people are not doing uh, any screening right now, and amongst the ones who are, the primary populations being screened are HIV positive men and women and HIV negative MSM, with some screening women with vulvar disease or cancer. Our next polling question. This is for physicians. How many patients do you screen for AIN on a monthly basis? A, none, B, 1 to 10, C, 11 to 20, D, 20 plus. Okay, so <clears throat> for those of you who are doing screening at this point, the majority of you are screening relatively small numbers of patients uh, in the 1 to 10 range per month. And now for polling question number three, this is for the labs. How many anal cytology specimens do you process per month? A, none, B, 1 to 20, C, 20 to 50, D, 50 plus. Okay, so um, about 40% are not receiving any specimens, but about half are receiving specimens in the 1 to 20 per month or so. Uh, relatively small proportions are receiving 20 to 50 or more. Well, let's talk about why uh, we are encouraging people to think about anal cytology screening. A couple of points I want to make from this slide. 
First is that if you look at the incidence of anal cancer in the general population, you'll notice that the incidence is relatively low, on the order of one to two or so per 100,000, but the incidence is increasing in both men and women in the general population on the order of about 2% per year. Uh, this has been a fairly constant rate of increase uh, since the 70s and at the moment doesn't show any sign of changing. You'll also notice that the incidence of anal cancer is higher in women than it is in men in the general population. What about the absolute number of cases of cancer? <coughs> well, in 2011, there were 5,820 cases diagnosed. The majority of them were in women, uh, and there were 770 deaths, again, the majority of them in women. According to the SEER database, we've seen a significant increase that's continuing between 2003 and 2007, and that is true in both men and women. Now, as you might expect, with the annual increase, the number of estimated new deaths for 2012 is going to be higher, and uh, the American Cancer Society is estimating that this year there will be 6,230 deaths from anal cancer, uh, cases of anal cancer, and 780 deaths from anal cancer. <coughs> Finally, as you might expect, uh, given the uh, changes that have mostly occurred in the 70s, that the risk of anal cancer very much depends on your birth cohort, where the incidence is highest in the birth cohort from 1950 and on, with a fairly substantial increase, but most of that increase is actually seen in women. Uh, there is an increase in men, but it isn't as quite as pronounced. Now let's talk about the risk groups for anal cancer. So what I've told you is that the incidence of anal cancer is certainly going up in the general population, but it's still relatively low. However, what we've now uh, come to appreciate is that the risk of anal cancer is not evenly spread throughout the population, but that it is very much concentrated in some of the highest risk groups that we'll talk about. And this is uh, actually a wonderful opportunity because it means that we can, in fact, concentrate our screening and treatment resources on those populations. So let's explore a little bit what those are. First, let's talk about the incidence of cervical cancer in the U.S., since the cervix is our model. And prior to the introduction of cervical pap smear screening, that incidence was estimated to be as high as 40 to 50 per 100,000. Now, of course, we've been screening uh, with cervical cytology followed by treatment of CIN to reduce the incidence of cervical cancer for decades now. And the incidence has declined to about 8 per 100,000 here. What about anal cancer? I've told you that it's a relatively uncommon disease, and in general population, it's about 1.8 per 100,000. But in one of those high-risk populations, namely men who have sex with men, before the HIV epidemic, the incidence was estimated to be as high as 35 per 100,000, putting it roughly in the same ballpark as cervical cancer before we were screening women. Now, of course, many MSM uh, were at risk of by acquiring HIV, and the question was, how did that affect the incidence of anal cancer? And prior to the advent of antiretroviral therapy, that estimate <coughs> was about 70 plus per 100,000, or at least twice as high than the HIV negative MSM population. Now, of course, we're in the era of ART, and you might wonder whether that has increased or decreased the incidence of anal cancer in <coughs> HIV positive MSM. We actually predicted a long time ago for a variety of reasons that the incidence would increase, and unfortunately, that is actually what happened. And here are some data from the largest HIV cohort uh, in the United States. Um, and you can see that <coughs> since the advent of ART in 1996, the incidence has been 131 per 100,000 in HIV-infected MSM. It is also very high in women, on the order of about 30 per 100,000. So in this group, particularly the men, the incidence of anal cancer is actually higher than the highest incidences of cervical cancer anywhere in the world. Now, <clears throat> we focus primarily on HIV as a source of immune suppression and a risk factor, but there are other forms of immune suppression that might put somebody at risk. For example, uh, data from the U.S. transplants show that the incidence of anal cancer, at least the standardized incidence ratio, is five times higher 
than the general population. So this is another group that we need to consider for anal cancer screening. And interestingly, uh, that risk is not as high for cervical cancer. The SIR is about one, which doesn't mean that they're not <coughs> at risk for cervical cancer. It simply means we think that that risk isn't increased because we're routinely screening for cervical cancer in this population, whereas we're not screening for anal cancer in this population. Therefore, the group that um, remains at risk are both men and women who have had a transplant and who have not been screened for anal disease. There is another group that we need to think about as well, <coughs> and this is women who have had anal genital HPV infection at a non-anal site. So for example, in, a women, in women who've had a history of CIM3, you can see that the risk of anal cancer is higher than women who've never had a history of CIM3. This makes sense because they share a common risk factor in the form of HPV infection. In contrast, we see no difference between women with or without a history of rectal cancer, and that isn't surprising because rectal cancer, unlike anal cancer, is not considered to be an HPV-related lesion. So let's talk about comparisons between anal and cervical cancer. They share common risk factors. Since they are both associated with HPV, it isn't surprising that some of those risk factors include sexual intercourse, vaginal or anal. Uh, both of these cancers are associated with high-risk HPV, particularly HPV 16 and 18. About 90% or more of anal cancers are associated with HPV. HPV 16 and 18 account for about 50% and 20% respectively of cervical cancers. <clears throat> In the anus, HPV-16 is even more prominent, probably accounting for 80% or more of anal cancers. These two cancers also share anatomic commonality. They both occur largely but not exclusively in the transformation zones. Dr. Darrow will talk more about these later. Uh, they also occur in regions of active squamous metaplasia, and that isn't surprising since this is the area that is most vulnerable to infection with high-risk HPV types. These cancers not only share morphologic similarity, but since they're etiologically similar, it's not surprising that they share similarity in their precancerous lesions. So the <coughs> cytologic changes that you might see in the cervix and the anus are very similar, as you're, you'll hear about in a bit, and CIN and AIN look very similar as well. Now, <clears throat> it's useful to think about the uh, events that lead to cancer in the form of HPV infection and AIN when thinking about the populations that might be considered for screening. A lot of different studies have been done at this point, for instance, about HPV infection in the anus of high-risk populations such as MSM. Uh, this is a slide from a study that we did a few years ago in San Francisco. I like to show it because, to my knowledge, it's the only population-based data. Data were collected from samples obtained through random digit telephone dialing. And what we found was that amongst MSM who were HIV positive, 88% actually had anal HPV infection and 72% had a high-risk HPV type. That's really high. We also found that the HIV negative MSM had a very high HPV prevalence, 57% and 34% had an oncogenic HPV type in this one sampling. What about women? <clears throat> of course, we've had data for a long time on cervical HPV infection. People have only started to focus on anal HPV infection in the last decade or so. This was an early study that we did which made, I think, a very important point, which is that if you compare anal and cervical HPV infection, the prevalence of anal infection is surprisingly high. Now these are high-risk women from the Women's Interagency HIV study. These are high-risk women at risk for HIV infection, and these are actually HIV-positive women. But you will see that in blue, we show the prevalence of anal HPV infection, that in each of these groups, anal infection is more common than cervical. So high-risk population, a little concerning. You may wonder, what about healthier women who don't have these kind of risk factors? Several studies have been done now mostly showing that the prevalence of anal HPV infection is about the same as cervical or higher. So this phenomenon that we're showing here is not only for the highest risk women. Uh, how does all this translate into disease? 
Well, in that women's interagency HIV study that I showed you from the previous slide, the prevalence of AIN is the same as CIN, 16%, in the HIV positive women, and it's lower but equivalent in the cervix and the anus in the HIV negative women. What about healthier women? This was an interesting study that was done in a dysplasia clinic where all of the women had a history of CIN, VIN, or AIN, or VAIN. And in that group, 12.5%, 12.2% had AIN overall, and 8% had AIN 2 or 3. So this is also a high-risk group. And then finally, what about the men who were in that population-based study that we did in San Francisco? Remember, the HIV-positive MSM had an overall HPV prevalence of 88%. Well, in that group, 43% had a high-grade lesion in that single testing. Amongst the 57% of men who had HPV, who were HIV negative, overall in that group, 25% had a high-grade lesion. So AIN, particularly high-grade AIN, is extraordinarily common, both in HIV positive and HIV negative MSM. So we can put together a list based on this kind of thinking as to who is at highest risk for anal cancer and therefore should be perhaps the highest priority for anal cancer screening. Based on the information I've given you, that would include MSM, it would include patients, men or women, with HIV, it would include people who are immunosuppressed for reasons other than HIV, uh, that would mostly be solid organ transplant, but could include people on steroids or perhaps having chemotherapy and probably should include women who have HPV-related disease at other sites, particularly the vulva, because the closer you get to the anal canal, the riskier it is to have an anal lesion, but probably cervical cancer and high-grade CIN as well. So taken together, the information and experience obtained through years of managing cervical disease can be very helpful in helping us put together ways to approach anal disease. This would include a combination of cytology as a screening test, followed by colposcopy to visualize the source of those abnormal cells in the anus. We call that high-resolution anoscopy, even though we use a colposcope. And then we guide our treatment based on the histology as determined from the HRA-guided biopsies. So where do we stand with respect to screening guidelines? I'd have to say that overall, at the moment, there really are no formal national screening guidelines that say that these populations must be screened for anal disease. However, many experts, ourselves included, believe that it is useful and helpful to screen and treat AIN to reduce the incidence of anal cancer, and that is our practice. CDC acknowledges that experts uh, recommend anal cytologic screening for HIV-positive men and women. The American Cancer Society says something quite similar. They say that some doctors already recommend this test for people at high risk for anal cancers, such as those who are HIV positive. And some entities have gone further, such as the New York State Department of Public Health, which has said that HIV positive individuals should have routine anal cytology screening. Um, that would include MSM, any patient with a history of condyloma, and women with abnormal cervical or vulvar histology. And then quite recently, the American College of Colorectal Surgeons has changed their practice parameters uh, and have recommended anal cytologic examination. They're actually giving it a strong recommendation, however, based on low quality evidence, which is an issue that I'll come back to a little bit later. All that said, um, what we are advocating is a system that is very much based on the cervical model and in which we would perform a series of procedures done in the order shown here, starting with an anal cytology. And we recommend that first, not only because we think it's the best screening test available right now, but also because this is the test that must be done before any form of lubrication is inserted into the anal canal. So if you're doing these procedures at the same exam, it's important to do the cytology first. Next, we recommend a digital anal rectal examination. You've seen this before, mostly listed as a DRE, or digital rectal examination. We want to change that and call it a DARE, so that we can include the A for anal, because the purpose of this is to put your finger into the anal canal and feel perianally for lumps that may be suspicious for anal cancer, making this 
the cancer screening test, as opposed to the cytology and HRA that you'll hear more about from Dr. Dara, where you might feel things that you wouldn't necessarily see. So this is an important part of your assessment. This would be followed by high-resolution anoscopy and then biopsying lesions to determine the grade of the lesion so that you can then link this to the treatment. This is critical because we believe that we shouldn't even be screening unless we have the entire infrastructure set up at our institutions that will allow us to take care of the patients who are going to come back with abnormal results. So if you don't have the ability to follow up on an abnormal cytology or perform an HRA or treat the patients, then it probably shouldn't be done, this screening, but instead, probably at least a at a minimum, a digital anal rectal examination. So with that, it's my pleasure to turn the screen over to Dr. Terry Dara. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Katie. Um, I want to talk a little bit about more about the specifics about anal cytology. First off, um, patients come as they are. They don't need any special preparation. In fact, it's probably best that they don't have anything like an enema or a douche prior to having the anal cytology collected. Our group, um, the device of choice, the collection device of choice, is a tap water moistened Dacron swab or a polyester synthetic fiber swab, not cotton, synthetic. This is also on a um, synthetic stick, a plastic stick, as opposed to a wood stick, which is what's usually on a cotton Q-tip. One of the reasons is that when you're applying the lateral pressure that I'll describe, you don't want to have a pre-score swab or a wooden stick that might splinter. When you're doing a cytology, uh, collecting the sample, you insert the swab all the way to the distal rectum and past the anal sphincters. And then using a cone-shaped arc, you um, slowly retract the swab as you're applying that lateral pressure. And then you can use either a liquid-based cytology or a direct smear. And what you want to do is sample the entire anal canal, everything from that distal rectum through the anal transformation zone, through the uh, non-keratinized squamous epithelium to the keratinized squamous uh, epithelium. Now this whole canal at rest is opposed by the tone of the external and internal anal sphincters. And so you want to, it's, it's puckered, and you want to apply enough pressure that you get into the, uh, the puckers, the, the valves and columns um, as you collect the sample. You can have your patient positioned in either lithotomy or on a uh, line on their side. When I see my patients in the GYN dysplasia clinic, I'm using lithotomy because that's how I'll do a colposcopy. But if you want the patients, um, if you're going to be doing an HRA, usually they're uh, um, on the lateral side. I'm, um, some surgeons actually do the HRAs in the prone uh, jackknife position as well. It's basically getting access to the anal canal. Then you again insert all the way to the distal rectum until the swab abuts against that wall. And then very slowly, as you apply lateral pressure, you withdraw the swab. Take at least 20 seconds. Count slowly to adequately collect cells. So you're sampling as much of that canal epithelium as possible. The pressure that you're putting on should um, bend the swab. Again, another reason why you wouldn't want to use the pre-score swab or the wooden Q-tips. Um, and again, you count slowly, so gentle but firm pressure. This is very well tolerated by our patients. After you're done uh, collecting the swab, you can um, immediately place the uh, collection the, the swab in um, a vial of liquid-based media. 
Uh, and then you have to vigorously work to get the cells off your swab. So swishing for at least 20 seconds, banging the swab up against um, the side of the vials. Then you recap the vial tightly, and then you can send um, to the laboratory. If you don't use liquid-based cytology, you can also do a conventional smear. In the laboratory, we can prepare uh, the let me just go back a sec. In the laboratory, we can uh, if we use a liquid-based cytology, if you're using a thin prep, you can uh, prepare that, um, put the uh, sample directly into preservicite solution, and then using the non-GYN filter, uh, prepare your slide. Dr. Plux, uh, Plusky mentioned how important the digital anal rectal exam is. So dare to dare. This is where uh, the cancer test, where we feel areas of induration, nodularity, areas that might be painful to the patient, and those are all so signs of possibly being um, a malignancy. Now there's clearly things that are not malignant that you might feel, things like hemorrhoids, uh, things like condyloma. Uh, in men, of course, you're also palpating uh, the prostate gland. But Anal cytology was included in the um, 2001 Bethesda system, and it was then, and in many ways still is now, a relatively new tool for screening for intraepithelial disease of the anal canal. These are HPV-associated lesions, just the same way as we screen for HPV-associated lesions of the cervix using the pap test. And as Dr. Pulewski indicated, the highest risk individuals are those with HIV disease and men who have sex with men. And we use criteria that are very similar to GYN cytology to diagnose these same lesions in the anal canal. And we use the same words, uh, low cell, high cell, ask us, and ask age. In fact, at UCSF, we use the exact same template that we use for GYN cytology to um, report anal cytology, a non-GYN cytology. So that we have uh, information regarding our interpretation as well as specimen adequacy, and I might add um, presence or absence of anal transformation zone. The Bethesda system also gives us some guidelines for specimen adequacy. As you know, for liquid-based cytology, on cervical cytology, you want approximately 5,000 well-visualized squamous cells. For the anus, it's a little bit lower, 2,000 to 3,000 um, squamous cells, again, nucleated squamous cells. Um, that equates to one to two nucleated squamous cells per high power field on a thin prep, or three to six nucleated squamous cells per high power field for a sure path preparation. In my experience, uh, um, most anal cytologies have um, equivalent cellularity as the majority were the average GYN cytology. The liquid-based um, preps do help clean up some of the background fecal material and fecal flora, but not all. And um, they also really help reduce the mechanical and air-dry artifacts that are a little bit more prevalent on anal cytology than on GYN cytology, if you are going to be doing a conventional a smear. So what do you want to see when you look at um, an anal cytology? Well, all the components of that anal canal that you've sampled. So bottom right here, these are rectal columnar cells here forming true glands. We don't see that with the uh, endocervical uh, mucosa. You also can see um, squamous metaplastic cells, an intermediate and superficial type um, nucleated squamous cells. And because of the juxtaposition of the keratinized and the non-keratinized mucosa that you're sampling with an anal cytology, you'll often see anucleated squames on anal cytology as well. Because of that juxtaposition, you'll also see more uh, evidence of keratinized lesions on anal cytology. Some of the fun stuff to look at 
is, you know, sort of the icing on the cake with GYN cytology is we can often also identify um, organisms, bugs. And for the um, cytologists on the, on the call, on the webinar, you'll be easily able to uh, recognize these multinucleated giant cells with this smudgy uh, intranuclear inclusion of herpes simplex virus or the uh, shish kebab type cells um, by the candida. A little bit less common, in fact quite uncommon on GYN cytology are the um, bottom panel of organisms. On the far left, these are amoebic organisms and you can see both the amoebic forms and the cyst forms. Um, and they can either be uh, pathologic, such as Entamoeba histolytica, or commensals. And we also have a number of commensal um, amoeba that live normally in our gut, non-pathologic. In the middle bottom panel, you see a egg of pinworm. And the far right, something that I've only encountered a couple of times, and this is um, the one that I'm showing you, is from a patient with AIDS, uh, very sick. Uh, gentleman who died of disseminated strongyloidiasis. But the, the meat of the matter, what we're screening for are the, um, the epithelial abnormalities caused by HPV. In the anal canal, those are primarily squamous. I, um, there is not an equivalent of endocervical AIS or endocervical adenocarcinoma in the anal canal. Of the adenocarcinomas that I've seen, they've been run-of-the-mill colon cancers, just lowly situated in the uh, rectum. So let's go through and look at least at the low-grade, high-grades in cancers. So a composite panel, uh, uh, the cytologist again would very easily recognize the HPV cytopathic effect, uh, both on cytology and histology. Here high-grade disease, cytology and histology, and then the pleomorphic giant cell of squamous cell carcinoma. Um, as you all know, uh, low-grade lesions are essentially productive viral infections. They're where um, the virus is making complete and intact uh, replicas of itself. The low-grade lesions have been caused by both the uh, high-risk and the low-risk viral types. Um, and by and large, many of these could regress spontaneously, particularly if the patient is immunocompetent. Here on cytology, some low-grade lesions with great HPV cytopathic effect, this um, distinct perinuclear halo. Here on um, one that's not quite as uh, well-developed perinuclear halo, you can see the, big, the great nuclear features, nuclear enlargement, hyperchromasia, and uh, irregularity in cells that have abundant cytoplasm. On histology, the lesions can um, vary quite a bit in their topography and their contours. They can either be flat or microspiculated, more acuminate. They can be non-keratinized or keratinized. But here again, even the keratinized lesions can be seen up in the uh, anal transformation zone. The high-grade lesions are the ones that we're really uh, interested in. These lesions will either persist or progress. Now, the pers the, um, at currently, both for cervix and for anus, we cannot um, predict which the behavior of individual lesions. And that, therefore, in cervical disease, we treat all patients essentially with high-grade disease or watch them closely. With time, this, the virus, the HPV, actually becomes integrated into our own genome, into our own DNA. And with that, it can start wrecking the havoc on our cell cycle, which allows for the accumulation of DNA-damaged immortal cells that can lead eventually to cancer. And that's what we want to get before our patients get cancer. Here's some uh, examples of high-grade uh, SIL on anal cytology. Big, bad, ugly nuclei, enlarged hypochromatic irregular contours or chromatin. Uh, you can see that many of these cells have dense metaplastic cytoplasm, indicating that they're from the anal transformation zone. One of the other things we commonly see on anal cytology 
particularly from the uh, HIV positive MSM population, is a mixture of uh, low grade and high grade in the same um, patient sample. You also see more degenerative changes on anal cytology. And here on histopath, high grade right at the squamocolumnar junction, and here high grade extending down uh, rectal glands. Cancers, again, that's what we want to, to catch. Clearly, the earlier we get a cancer, diagnose a cancer, the better prognosis our patients will have. The, on anal cytology, they can be a little bit more you know, difficult uh, to diagnose than on cervical cytology, in part because the diathesis may not be as prominent. Uh, here you can see some of the clinging diathesis on a liquid-based cytology, uh, and that can be harder to, to separate out from um, uh, uh, fecal, normal fecal flora. But you can see the pleomorphism in the uh, more keratinized or the tumor giant cells here in a non-keratinized cancer and then in this other non-keratinized cancer, see the very prominent macronucleoli. On histopathology, many of these lesions are keratinized. They don't have to keratinize. And then um, oftentimes you'll see the uh, atypical mitotic figures as well. So some of the issues that um, you, we have to deal with with anal cytology are adequacy issues. We do not directly visualize the anal canal uh, like we visualize the cervix with the use of a speculum to take an anal sample. So getting an adequate cellularity on anal samples can be a little bit more challenging. Anal cytology also often underrepresents the grade of disease that we find, now, even more so than it does on, uh, with cervical cytology. So it's um, less uncommon, it's more common to find high-grade disease in a patient with low cell or ascus on their anal cytology. But high-grade disease, whether we predict it on a cervical cytology or an anal cytology, that positive predicted value is very good. So most of the time, those are true positives, the patient will have high-grade disease. So anal cytology is really complementary, even probably more so to all of the other findings that we have, uh, clinical findings, what the patient looks like on colposcopy, on high resolution anoscopy, what are the findings of our digital anal rectal exam, and what are the um, findings on our uh, colposcopic directed biopsies. Again, the uh, gold standard is the biopsy, but if they, um, if a cytologist, we say there's high grade, and they, and the clinician has not found high grade disease. They most likely have actually missed it, rather than it being a uh, false positive. And as Dr. Pulaski mentioned, it's essential if we're going to be screening for the intraepithelial lesions that we have access to other clinicians or ourselves who can evaluate those abnormal cytologies and uh, potentially treat our patients as well. So with that, I'm going to turn the, uh, the uh, computer screen oh, back to uh, Dr. Plesky for some wrap-up. And then we'll do our Q&A. Hello again. So I would just like to summarize where, uh, where we are with respect to our thinking <clears throat> about the populations that are most suitable for screening. So firstly, uh, I think we should be thinking about MSM, both HIV positive and HIV negative. You'll notice on this slide that we're introducing one more concept, which is the age at which we should be considering screening. It's our belief that we should be considering screening those over the age of 30 when they're HIV positive and over the age of 40 when they're HIV negative. The primary intent here being to not overscreen the younger populations where the cancer rates are low and where there might be excessive morbidity for the benefit accrued in doing screening and treatment. So 30 for HIV positives, 40 for HIV negatives. We also think that HIV positive men should be considered for screening regardless of sexual orientation or risk factor for HIV, as should all HIV positive women. Additional groups to consider are those with immunosuppression, including transplant immune 
associated immune suppression or other causes such as uh, steroids. <coughs> and then women who have a history of anogenital disease, particularly high-grade disease or cancer, uh, in the vulva or the cervix, but particularly the vulva since it is so proximal to the uh, anal canal. And then lastly, individuals who have HPV-related disease perianally are probably at high risk of intraanal disease as well. So should we be doing this? It's our practice to do so. We think that based on the years of experience with cervical cancer prevention and the biological similarity between cervical and anal disease, that it is reasonable and useful to screen for AIN in these high-risk populations to reduce the risk of anal cancer. We still have some big questions to answer. We still don't know whether what we're doing will lower the incidence of anal cancer, though we think there's enough suggestion that it will to make it worth doing even now. And of course, we don't know whether treatment of AIN to reduce the risk of anal cancer is possible. We know that we can treat AIN and get rid of the lesion, but is it reducing the risk of cancer? We don't know yet. But as I said, many experts around the country believe that the risk of cancer in some of these high-risk populations is too high to wait for the results of the data and the, and the data for the study that we think will and hopefully get done to address this question in the longer term. I also want to mention that there is a new professional society devoted to all things anal, and that is the International Anal Neoplasia Society, uh, which will be, um, we hope, a very useful uh, entity for promoting exchange and scientific information related to detection, pathogenesis, and prevention of anal cancer. We encourage all of you who are interested to join us. More information is available on the website at www.iansoc.org. And then uh, last but not least, uh, I want to show you a gift uh, to us from Dr. Alan Waxman, president of the ASCCP who uh, has a very unique vantage point when it comes to uh, wildlife. <laughs> so uh, I believe we can now take some questions and have a question and answer period. So there's a, a question here regarding uh, sampling devices, um, specifically at the flocked swabs. They're, uh, I believe, nylon. and uh, I know others have used the flock swabs to collect um, and they get adequate samples with them. The main thing is they cost a significant um, uh, more than uh, the, the synthetic fiber swabs. Uh, in, in our practice, again, for the last 20 some years, we've been using that Dacron type of swab. There's a question here on whether AIN can regress spontaneously. Um, we don't have a whole lot of data on the natural history, but it is almost certain that it can regress spontaneously. <clears throat> There's a question here about screening intervals. Uh, we've done some formal cost-effectiveness analyses and showed a number of years ago that if you're in HIV-negative MSM, the optimal screening interval, if your initial screening cytology is negative, would be every two to three years. And if you're HIV-positive, it would be every year. Um, and the next question is regarding uh, anal sex. And um, can you, should you include women who practice anal sex uh, in uh, a screening program? Having uh, anal intercourse is probably the most efficient way of getting the virus to the transformation zone. Same for the, you know, vaginal sex for the cervix, anal sex for the anal transformation zone. However, the, um, if you have HPV disease in anywhere in your lower anal genital tract, you may have it in your anal canal as well. That whole epithelia is trophic for the virus. How, given that saying, that, I, that would say everybody should have anal cytology, but we also know that the incidence of anal cancer in healthy women and men is very, very low. So it probably will not pay, um, it's not a good use of our limited medical resources to screen patients based on their history of, uh, oh, to screen immunocompetent women 
on the basis of their history of anal sex, more so on their history of have they and their HPV virus already made disease. So if they have high-grade disease, particularly high-grade disease of the vulva, cervical cancer, then you should think about screening them. Terry, I would agree with that and just add that having receptive anal intercourse for women is probably not going to be an effective tool to triage because a very high proportion, in fact, of American women report having had at least one episode of receptive anal intercourse at some point in time, probably at least 50 percent. So I think you're right that we would need other uh, indicators of risk uh, on top of that. Uh, there's a question here about treatment for AIN, a very important question. Uh, a, a somewhat long answer, but I'll just summarize it by saying that we, te we tend to treat small lesions that are limited in size and number with topical 85% trichloroacetic acid, and the bigger lesions, which unfortunately is more the norm, with an, an ablative method such as infrared coagulation or um, hyfrication. Um, oftentimes they need multiple treatments, but if you stick with it, you will get rid of most of those lesions. Here's a, a great question regarding the histopathology. So can we use biomarkers such as P16 to better classify the tweener lesions, the IN2s, the AIN2s, like we uh, use it as part of the, the last project recommendations for CIN2? And the answer is yes. In my practice, I use P16 about 20% of the time on anal biopsies. And it really can help um, especially separate out mimics. That anal transitional epithelium is uh, you throw on some inflammatory change and it actually can be uh, very difficult to separate out um, the mimics of high-grade disease from true high-grade disease. And P16 helps us do that. Um, and then a cytology question. When do you consider an anal smear to be uh, unsatisfactory? So if you're doing a conventional smear, you want to guesstimate to have 5,000 nucleated squamous cells. The, on smear cytology, it's more difficult to guesstimate numbers of cells than it is on um, uh, liquid-based cytology. It's I, and if I misspoke, it's not 5,000, it's two to 3,000 um, cells for the anal. So it's a little less cellular than what you'd consider minimum cellularity for a uh, cervical cytology. We have a question here about whether we would recommend HPV vaccination to decrease disease incidence. The answer is an emphatic yes. Yes. Um, it is now routine to vaccinate both boys and girls. Uh, the target age range is about 12 to 13. For girls, that can be given routinely up to age, girls and women up to age 26. For uh, boys and men up to age 21. And if you're HIV positive or immunocompromised, routinely up to age 26. Since HPV-16 makes up an even higher proportion of anal cancers than cervical, we think that the impact of vaccination, proportionally speaking, might be even higher to prevent anal cancers than cervical cancer. But the vaccine must be given before people uh, get exposed to HPV since it's really a preventive vaccine, not a therapeutic vaccine. So the earlier it can be given prior to initiation of sexual activity or as soon as possible thereafter, the, the better. The other issue, of course, is that we have many millions of people who've already been exposed to HPV who were never vaccinated. These are the people who we think we need to target with secondary prevention measures such as the cytology, HRAs, and biopsies and treatment that we've been talking about. And we haven't, as the country, done as well as Australia or the UK in getting vaccination to our young people. So we still need to work on that. And the FDA has approved it to give to boys as well. So that will help us get to a point where we have enough herd effect and coverage that we'll actually see a decrease in uh, HPV disease. Um, another question regarding cytology and, and what do you need? So if you only see um, a nucleate squames, uh, that's not enough. You need nucleated squamous cells. 
And we're actually getting towards the end of our time here. So Dr. Plesky, is there one more question that you'd like to, or a point that you'd like to make? Um, simply that this is a growing area and um, we hopefully will be generating a lot of important uh, data that will guide us in optimizing our approaches. But uh, in the meantime, I would strongly consider uh, those groups that would benefit from intervention right now at a minimum digital anorectal examination. And if you have the ability to consider getting trained in high resolution endoscopy, biopsies, and treatment. And with that, we thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.